you can't be a follower of Jesus Christ and right. say, I know what you said, Jesus, but I prefer to believe. But that's kind of where we are. Yeah. Do we have to disclose identities in this podcast? We don't have to. Oh. <laughs> Relationship is never built in rows. Hmm. So in the in the auditorium, it's it's set not to build relationship. Right. Relationship is built around the table. Yeah. He starts walking toward me, and I said, uh, "You know, our, our church does these cookies just to show you God's love and welcome you to the community." And he said, "What did you say?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, our church." And before I even finished, he collapsed on the ground sobbing, uh, and I said, "What's going on?" And he said, I have a gun over there and I was about to kill myself and I was sitting here praying, God, if there's another way, send me a sign. And so I sat there with this man for quite a while until his family and stuff got there and he just kept saying, he heard me, he answered me. Uh, you know, frankly, we've got a lot of lukewarm people in our churches. I mean, I beg God to take the the desire to pastor away. One of my favorite Hendrix quotes, Howard Hendrix is, not Jimmy, um, you can impress somebody at a distance, but you can only impact them up close. God can handle the big questions. Hi, I'm Chris McNeil, and this is Ministry on the Move, a journey podcast interviewing pastors and ministers across the country. As the father of the McNeils, I get to travel all across this land singing the gospel, and one day it dawned on me that I was already having great conversations with pastors. And then came the conviction that maybe I should hit the record button and share these inspiring, insightful, and hopeful conversations with you. Join me on a journey to churches of all shapes and sizes, different parts of the country, and see just what it takes to shepherd the body of Christ. For more information on the McNeils, you can visit us at mcneilmusic.tv or mcneilmusic.com or follow us on Facebook at The McNeils with two L's. Thanks for joining us, and here's the show. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. This is Chris McNeil. I'm going to get to, right to it. This is the second part of my interview with John Gators, the pastor of Bemis Baptist in Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, should have another episode drop today as well. It's the bonus content. It's really not an episode. Um, it'll just be a bonus part of the interview with John because uh, we kind of let the tape run long and we just kept talking even after the end of this episode. And... Uh, sort of turned the tables on me. So it a uh, little bit of insight into the McNeils, and I hope that you enjoy listening to that. If you would be so kind as to um, write, thumbs up, um, give us a review, a like, a share. In some way, let us know that you're out there and that you're listening and that you think it's worthwhile. Let us know what questions you'd like for us to at me to ask pastors in future episodes. It would be really beneficial, just helpful to me. You know, we go into churches and we can see people but doing this on a podcast, I can't see you. And so the way that you can communicate back is uh, is by giving us a like or a thumbs up or a, an email or whatever. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining, and I'll get right to it. This is the second part of the interview with John Gators. How do we... I'm, I'm formulating this question is, even as I'm trying to ask it. How do we... How do we learn to turn off the voice of the world? <laughs> well, you've done a pretty good job of it because you don't do any social media. <laughs> I was like, I'm asking you at lunch, like, have you heard this? No. Have you heard of this? No. Do you know this guy? No. Like, do you live under a rock? I try. I do try. Do you go to the deepest, darkest parts of Texas where there mm -hmm. there is no internet or something? Well, we have internet. I just don't get on it unless I have to. And that may do you. Uh, that may be one of the reasons you're so happy. <laughs> I I I'm limited. I limit myself to what I do on social media. I do, 
I do use it to try and keep my eyes on what what is going on, right. you know, yeah, what's out there. Um, and I think I'm probably more informed than most of my church members because sometimes I will bring things to them. Like in our Wednesday night Bible study, it's very relaxed. We can ask questions and stuff. And I will sometimes show them things. I was like, I don't, you, you may not be aware that this is what is going on and calling itself church. And you can just see people shaking their heads like, no, I never, that's, that's, that's insane. Yeah. Why are they doing that? And I'm like, right. and not to discourage you, but I just want you to understand that's out there, and that calls itself church. Mm-hmm. Okay, but you go back to the the parabolic discourse in Matthew chapter 13 when Jesus, you know, he started with the parable of the, the sowing the seeds, and then he moved on to the parable of the weeds in the wheat field. Okay, and he gets to the one about the mustard seed. Mm-hmm. And when I was growing up, I was taught that that was the one where the mustard seed, though it be so small, it grows into this great tree. Um, I was taught that that was... Jesus saying that uh, the kingdom of heaven, the church was just going to blossom and bloom and overshadow the world, and the world was just going to get increasingly better and better and better. And I don't think anybody actually believes that anymore. A little bit Pollyannish. Okay. But if you look at all of his parables given all together, and you use one to um, explain the others, Mm. one of the things that he says about the, the mustard seed, it's not really intended to be a tree. It's a plant, and yet he says it becomes a tree, okay? And there's a whole theology about trees versus vines, Mm -hmm. okay? And Jesus didn't call himself a tree. Babylon is a tree. Jesus is a vine. Interesting. There's a difference. So he says that the mustard tree, it actually becomes, in this case, a tree when it wasn't intended to be a tree. And he also says it's so large that the birds of the air can perch in it. Mm -hmm. Well, go back to the first one. What are the birds of the air? That's Satan's minions. So when I read that, I think Jesus is saying, oh, in the last days, what calls itself the church will become inflated into this thing it's not really supposed to be. Interesting. And it will support the birds of the air, which is all of these crazy characters you see on TV saying, if you just send me $1,000, I'll send you this rag I sweat on. It's got my holy sweat on it, you Uh know, and that kind of stuff. And we laugh at that. We say, well, that guy's he's crazy. You know, he, he's got four airplanes and three Rolls Royces and a $100 million home. He's crazy. But you understand how that kind of mentality has trickled down into church today. And that, that is what now the average pastor is looking, up is to. looking at. Yeah. Like, that's become the standard mm-hmm. for success in the ministry. And Jesus warned us, it's going to be like that. But that's kind of scary if I'm if and I could be interpreting this incorrectly, but if I'm interpreting it correctly, he's telling us that what is called the church won't be just his organic church, but this other aspect of it that Mm. supports Satan's work as well. And if you look at the book of Revelation, and I do believe that. I do believe in the rapture. I know it's become unpopular, but I believe in the rapture. But if you look at that, according to the book of Revelation, even after the church is raptured off the earth, you still have an institutional church. Right. Jesus calls it Babylon, but you still have ecclesiastical Babylon that has to be destroyed. So if the rapture happens and you still have a church on the earth that Jesus is going to destroy, then that's that mustard tree, in my opinion. This is a really aha moment for me. Okay. Yeah, I noticed you're looking at me weird. (laughs) You are stranger than normal. (laughs) In uh, um, uh, Romans 10 and 11, we're talking about who who the church is in light of Israel being replaced, or are they replaced? Replacement theology. Well, that is, they certainly everybody has to contend with Romans ten and eleven. This is talking about the stump and the grafting, right? And and he's Paul says this funny thing in there. It's a riddle almost, and I've always pondered it. He says all Israel is not Israel. Yeah, everybody's not a child of Abraham. But then there were those who became children of Abraham because they were grafted in. And and so by the same token, the church is not—all the church is not the church. And this is something that I, 
I like to point out to people, um, the church is the root of the church is Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. Oh, He's yeah. the vine. It's all Jewish. Right. And if you look at heaven, I mean, we talk about the New Jerusalem. We're going to live in a city named after Jerusalem. It's the new. You're going to live in Jerusalem. Right. right. And what are the twelve gates named after? Twelve tribes of Israel. Mm-hmm. You know, it's heaven is Jewish. Oh yeah. Is there, you can't get you can't escape that. No, no. And so this is the this is a reality. Um, I've been grafted in. Mm-hmm. I'm not the root. Mm-hmm. I'm grafted into that. Yep. I don't think. So what's the aha moment? What? Oh, th- well, you so so all, all Israel is not Israel. Well, and neither is the church. All the church. So, so you, you're you're you were talking about how the mustard seed becomes a tree instead of being a plant becomes a tree and and yes we've got the church but it's also not the church it's it's not the remnant but it's a church it's an institutionalized yes. church and i'm thinking in parallel well that's exactly what paul said in in romans 10 and 11 where he says all israel's not israel well was not israel elected were they right. not chosen exactly to, and they did did they all choose no, no 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 and it's the same it's the same notion just moved from Israel to the church. And I, I don't I don't guess I'd ever really squared well, those two up. One of the things we did um as going through Genesis, you know, we got to um <laughs> talking about Babylon. God uses Babylon over and over again right. to talk about things that are not of him. Um but he, he uses that analogy when he talks about these worldly empires and he talks about them in terms of trees. But when right. Jesus talks about him, the church, mm-hmm. he talks about a vine. Well, the vine is very different. A tree grows up, it sucks up all the resources, it sucks up all the water, it overshadows everything. Mm. Okay, so a world empire wants to be a tree, it wants to overshadow everything. Jesus is saying, but I'm a vine. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily grow mm-hmm. big and grand. You may not even notice me, mm-hmm. but I'm creeping here and there and going everywhere that I can, and I'm reaching out everywhere. Yep. Um I've, I preached that sermon, and our youth and children's pastor, Amanda, she gave me a gift, and you've moved it somewhere in here. There's an actual <laughs> vine, a potted vine that sits on oh. my desk right here, that's and she gave that to me. Um, yeah, that's it right there. Yeah. And I love it because that's that's what the church – we're, right. we're not supposed to be this thing that the world goes, wow, right. look at them. Right. We're supposed to be this vine that like – reaches out and grows and 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 goes and reaches to everybody but the world wants to make it into an empire right right and satan wants to make the church into an empire and so there you've got to fight that like no we're not meant to be a tree mm-hmm. that, that, i i need to stick an asterisk right here okay uh in the show notes um for anyone who is starting <clears throat> If, if you have not gone back and listened to other podcasts, you need to go back and grab the very first one. It may be the second one. I think it's the first one. Just, Just listen in, to both. Yeah. It, it's an interview that I did with Justin Gatlin, who is the pastor of Alvin Missionary Baptist Church, south of Houston, Texas. And and the title of it is called The Trellis and the Vine. That's what I entitled the podcast, uh, because we discuss in depth the notion of the vine and and Justin was talking about how with a vine there's there's pastors who do work on framing of the trellis yeah and that's the fun part yeah that's that's great um but then the vine work is the that's the messy stuff but the analogy certainly carries over and so I would just any encourage anyone who's sort of thinking along the crazy lines that I tend to. This is this is a good place for you to me to remind you. Just go back and listen to the first episode if you want to know more about the trellis and the vine. Uh, but to your point, did I have one? Yeah, you're saying <laughs> <I've> forgotten <laughs> that the the, the, the the tree is the symbol of pride and the vine is the symbol of humility. I think so. Yes, um, and. You know, the, the word pride is something that my family, we have tried to eject from our vocabulary. And I know that in today's day, it's funny because people will tell us that they're proud of us. And I, and I always wonder, 
what that's supposed to mean. I'm not... I think it. I think it means well. I think it. It's because I, I can understand that. I would say I'm proud of you because I feel like in the six years that I've known you, and and when I first met you, y'all were kind of just getting into this, right? Okay. Six years later, I think if anything, you're maybe even more humble than you were then. Hmm. Okay, that doesn't happen naturally. Because you've had a you've had a lot of musical success in those six years, you've become more well known, right? Certainly, but it hasn't puffed you up, nor has it puffed up your wife and your children. Yeah. So when they say we're proud of you, what they're saying is you've stayed true to yourself. Hmm. You've stuck to the vine. You're not trying to make McNeil Incorporated into an empire. Great. You're just trying to creep out there wherever you can go and serve the Lord. Am I wrong? No, no. Well, you see, I'm bragging on you a little bit, but I'm not really. I'm bragging on the Lord, but yeah. I'm using you as an example because, but it, you're having a hard time receiving that. Yeah, I don't like it when they interview. I'm interviewing you. <laughs> <laughs> no, is that my cue to hush? No, 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 no. You're fine. You're fine. Um, yeah. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't like the word pride, at least in the Bible, that it's never used in a good way. Correct. And and we certainly don't want to be proud or prideful. We don't want that sinful, selfish pride. Don't right, we? right. Not at all. Proud literally means to be to, to stand up above the things around you. Um, and we don't want that. That's the tree. Well, right. I mean, I'm, I I grew up, like I said, in construction background. So when we say something's proud, what yep. we mean is it's sticking out. That's right. It needs to be knocked down. It needs to be trimmed. Right. And, uh, <laughs> not you know, the nail needs to be sunk back into the wood or the, the sheetrock needs to be Something leveled is, or the yes. brick is out of line. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. exactly what it means. I, I made it my own base one time and, and I read a book on how to do it by a British guy. And he talked about how the frets on a base stood proud. They rose above the fretboard, and uh, that was that was perhaps the the most reasonable use of the word that I've ever seen. Yeah, that makes a it, lot of sense. It needed to happen. That's how you articulate the note. But but in my own life, I don't I don't want we don't we certainly don't want to to be proud. But you receive some of that. Um affirmation very much the way pastors do and it's uncomfortable for us because we truth is we need the encouragement oh sure okay that's right but you you don't you don't need to be adored you know i, I never want to be one of these pastors where people have this unhealthy adoration where you could do whatever you want right you know um i don't i don't want that because that's not godly but i've said before Anytime I go, if I speak somewhere outside of this church, if I'm if I'm preaching a revival, mm. if I'm preaching a funeral somewhere, a funeral home, anywhere that I go and I'm representing my church, I want them to be proud of me in the sense that I never want them to have to say, well, we love our pastor, but... Right. Yeah. Right. Now, I don't mean that I want them to be puffed up and, you know... Right, But, but sure. I do, you know, and maybe that's not the proper word to use... Now that you've explained it to me so well, the, but the word we use instead is is pleased. Yes, that's a good one. Um, I would want them to be pleased. Yeah, you know, I don't want them to be embarrassed and have to make excuses for me. Right, right. <laughs> and 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 to you know, in in talking about um, you know, reflecting, uh, I think it was, it may have been Guy Penrod. I can't remember. Somebody told me that. Um, Humanity was not made to receive glory. We were made to reflect it. Yes, that makes sense. And I think it was Guy, because he was explaining that when he puts his hands up, that's what he's doing, is deflecting, the, in his own mind at least, he's deflecting the praise. Because, I mean, people clap after every song yeah, yeah. that you sing, and even if they don't like it, you know, they're being polite. They They... Uh, but 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 sometimes there are times when you know uh, that they're they're saying at a boy they're rewarding you they're they're complimenting they're congratulating they're applauding they're, 
right? And, and it's at that moment that you've got a decision to make. Do, do you say, thank you, Lord, but it's, but it's you? Or you say, yeah, I think I might be all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> I sing sometimes at church. Of course, I came here as, as the music associate master. pastor yeah. of worship and outreach. And I do sing, and they're, they're very kind. And I don't know if I sing well, but they seem to enjoy hearing me sing when I do still. They let you still. And somehow this weird thing has happened where they don't clap after I sing anymore. Oh. And, and I, I've never said, don't do that. Right. I'm not quite sure how we got to that point. Um, I'm more comfortable with the silence mm. than I am with the clapping. But on the other hand, when somebody else sings, I'm usually the first person on my feet clapping. Right. So it's not that I'm opposed to somebody clapping because I I know they're not clapping for me or clapping for the person singing. You're 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 using like God moved me. I have somehow I have to express There's that a physical reaction. I got to it. express it somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm not opposed to clapping. Mm-hmm. I do it all the time. But for some reason, I'm uncomfortable receiving it. We're not made to accept glory. That's that's not in our DNA. We're made to reflect it. And can I say something here? Can I go back to the pastors we've been talking about? Yes. How they get sometimes get discouraged. Because I'll tell you, even though I'm 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 about as happy as a person can be. I'm very happy in my life. Hmm. Okay, and I'm very happy in my ministry. Very happy here. I don't want to do anything but this. Mm-hmm. But. I never just just for those people who are listening, you're like, what 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 does a pastor go through? I never walk out of here on Sunday morning and think, man, I did a great job with that. I never finish up a sermon and think I nailed it. That never crosses my mind. I I walk out and sometimes I'm walking as the chairman of the deacons or whoever is giving the benediction and I'm walking to the back to greet people. And I've got my head down because he's praying and I'm quietly moving out. And usually in my mind, I'm thinking, that wasn't very good. <laughs> and it, I don't think it's any kind of a self-loathing or anything. It's just I don't ever, I don't ever come out of there and thinking, man, I, I'm so good. Right. I, I don't feel that way. I usually walk out thinking, huh. And I want people to understand their pastor probably feels the same way. Right. Right. Now, sometimes I'm quite surprised standing in the back when somebody will walk up and say, you said da-da-da-da, and that really touched my heart. I'm like, I don't even remember saying that. Yeah. And and so then I'm receiving that, and, I'm, and, and what I'm getting is, okay, in spite of the fact that I'm a broken vessel, God still showed up, and he still said what needed to be said to each individual person in there. Yeah. That's how it works. In spite of you. Yes. Not because of you. <laughs> but, but I don't want people to ever think, well, my pastor's going to get the big hit. I mean, he may be right. vain and arrogant, but he's the exception to the rule. Most mm. of them are very humble. Yeah, you're right. And, I agree and, with that. And, and most of them probably feel as insecure as I do. And like I said, they walk in Monday morning, they, they sit down at their desk or whatever they're doing, and the first thing they're probably thinking is, there's a lot of stuff I really need to do that I haven't done well mm-hmm. or haven't gotten enough done, you know. Um, and I think the average church member needs to know that's probably where your pastor's at. Yep. He's probably not patting himself on the back. You might think he is. He's probably not. He's probably thinking, I haven't done a good job. Mm-hmm. And sometimes as church members, we don't think he needs it because, I mean, he's standing in front of everybody. He's getting all the adoration he needs. He doesn't need our affirmation. And you don't realize that he may go home and cry because he thinks he just didn't do a very good job. Yeah. How, okay, how then would you, how would you encourage the local assembly to support their pastor? Show up. You want to think about it? Take a minute. Show up. <laughs> yeah. Show up. Hmm. Now. As I said, I believe we're living in the age of apostasy where the remnant is not necessarily ever going to be the crowd. Right. Okay. But if you're part of the remnant, show up. 
And I've said this before, if you want to do evangelism, you're like, how do I do it? How do we reach our community? Well, if you have people who visit your church and they look around and the sanctuary is half empty, they're probably going to, and I I know people are supposed to walk by faith, not by sight, but we're talking about people who might be not that mature in their faith yet. So they walk into a church, it's half empty, they look around and they're like, oh, there must be something wrong here because not many people showed up. I'll go down the street. And and that's why they end up going to the big church. It's not that the big church is wrong, but it's packed. It's full. It's it's, it's exciting, man. God must be in that. Okay. God might be working more powerfully in that group of 40 people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if it's in a sanctuary that's designed to say to 100 and you've got 100 members, but only 40 are willing to come. Okay. So I always tell people, you want to do evangelism? Show up on Sunday morning. Mm. Or Wednesday night, maybe. That would be a bonus, <laughs> but at least on Sunday morning, if the whole church comes together, when somebody who's seeking the Lord shows up and visits your church, mm-hmm. what are they going to see? And that's I think that's the biggest complaint or criticism I have of modern Christianity is, you know, I don't necessarily have to go. And no, you don't have to attend church to be saved, but why don't you want to? I mean, that's the bride of Christ. That's right. that's his gathering. Why do you not? I, I've said this before. If you want to be married but not live with your wife, okay, that's fine, but that's weird. That's it not is. that's not how that's supposed to work. <laughs> it's a great you know? analogy. It's not how it's supposed to work. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, you've got your house, I've got mine. Why do we have to get together? Right. I'm, I, I'm kind of old-fashioned and romantic. We're going to live in this house together, mm-hmm. okay? Well, you've joined the church. You said, I am part of the bride of Christ. Why do you not want to be there? Why mm-hmm. do you not want to worship? Why do you not want to? But again, we have to teach people. You have been planted. If you're truly a child of God, you've been planted by the Holy Spirit. You've been given a gift, and Paul's very explicit your gift is used to edify the rest of the church. Mm-hmm. You can't do that from home. I read a, it may have been a YouTube video, um, it was, where uh, the, the guy was saying that a Facebook like had the same dopamine effect on the brain that nicotine or alcohol did. Um, I don't doubt that. And I wonder, I'm just tossing this out, see what you do with it. <clears throat> what are, are it, is the church having to compete with oversaturation of dopamine? Overstimulation. That the world, yeah, there you go. Overstimulate. This is why the church feels like we have to have the light show, we mm-hmm. have to have this, we have to have that, because that's what people have come to expect. And, okay, I'll put my critical hat on. We've also been, we've also come to expect that church is supposed to be an extremely well, high quality produced production, like professional musicians right. only, very well paid musicians professional television producers running the show and you watch it on television. And I love to watch Bellevue Baptist. I'm not, I'm not against a uh, mega church. Okay. Right. Okay. I just want people to understand if you're going to come to my church, don't expect us to be like Bellevue Baptist mm. because they have 10,000 people. Right. They have people there who have the skills to do that at mm-hmm. that level. Mm-hmm. Okay. We don't have that. You're going to come here and you're going to hear me playing the piano and I'm going to hit a bad note once in a while. <laughs> and you're going to hear Miss Jane over there on the organ, who I think is very good, but she doesn't think she's that good. But she she does a very good job. But neither of us are professional. Right. Okay, we have a choir full of people who can sing quite well, but they're not professional. Mm-hmm. They're not trained vocalists. Okay, we have a praise team. They're not trained. Voc- you're going to hear a bad note once in a while. Or I'm going to mess up on the piano every once in a while. So you're, the, the question is, do you want an authentic experience where God's people are coming together and using what gift they have to worship together? Or do you want to go watch a production that—and and, and I'm not—again, I'm not, 
I'm not saying that it is wrong or sinful for you to be in a large church where they can do that. But is everybody supposed to be in that? Is that what church has to be? Or can church be a local community of people who come together and use their gifts for the service of the Lord, be it imperfect, but can the Holy Spirit still show up and use that? I think I'd like to put a finer point on that. Go for that it. I, I think that I think that it has to do with, with the Christian experience. Is are are we being sold the bill of goods that says this slick, polished, airbrushed, auto tuned, photoshopped reality? I'm nodding my head, yes we are. Uh-huh. And, and and your pastor feels that pressure. Mm-hmm. He feels that pressure. Right. Whether you realize it or not, he feels that because he's been, everything in our culture is bombarding him and telling him that's the standard. Right. Yep. You're, you're supposed to be as polished as that guy. That guy may be a fantastic preacher of God, but he's probably got one sermon and he's probably got a hundred other people on staff to take care of everything else. He's probably got okay. people writing his sermons for him. <laughs> You've been at the hospital five times this week. Right. You've gone and visited two shut-ins. You have probably cleaned the kitchen at the church. Mm-hmm. Okay. You've helped get the bulletin together. You've done all that stuff. And you've probably prepared a Sunday school class. And then you're going to go preach Sunday morning. And you're expected to be as polished and perfect as him, yeah. it's not fair, but that's the standard. Right. And if he can't live up to that standard, and then you go on social media, you go on Instagram, for example, and you see video after video of those guys preaching, and the lighting is perfect, yeah. the stage is perfect. It's always there's the a, highlight reel. There's a thousand people there. Yep. It's and I'm not saying that he's wrong. I'm right. not saying he's bad. But when you see that all the time, you're like, that's the standard. Yep. Okay. So that's what your pastor is being Compared silently yeah. and indirectly told. That's that's what we expect out of you. You may not be saying it to him, but the world is saying that to him. Mm-hmm. And he's just a regular guy who loves the Lord. Right. And he's trying to study in between phone calls. And if the church is small enough, he's probably mowed the yard. Out there. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, sure. That's the typical church. I know him. So how do we, you know, I personally, like I said, I know of a few churches, and I say Bellevue is one of them because I absolutely I love that church. I have friends that are there. Uh, I like to watch. I like Steve Gaines. I like to watch him preach. I have nothing against the church itself. I don't have the heart for that. Mm. I would not want to be that. Now, they have a big singing Christmas tree every year. And some people criticize them because of it's so elaborate. When you've got 10,000 members, you've got people with the talent to do that. Sure. We attended that one time, and um, Pastor Gaines' wife came in, and we happened to have really good seats close to the front. And you would think that the pastor's wife of a church of that size would probably be kind of standoffish if she was even there. She mm. would probably be sort no, she was walking down the aisles introducing herself. I didn't even know who she was at first. Right. I'd met him. I'd never met her. Huh. And she's just walking by. And she says, oh, hey, Hart, where are you guys from? And so we were talking to her and everything. And she's just, you know, just friendly and everything. And then um, the, it's time for the thing to start. And she walks down and she takes her seat. And then I see Steve Gaines coming out like, he sits down beside her. I was like, that's his wife. She's just wandering around among these strangers, just welcoming everybody to her little church. I was like, that's a heart. Right. Right. I was <laughs> proud of her, if that's all right. If I could, I was very proud of her because she was not playing the part of I'm special. Industrial. Yeah. Yeah. Right, very right. gracious lady. Yep. All right. Let's finish this up with encouragement. I thought that's all we've done. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> we've been talking for nine hours. I know. Well, it's gone long. Um, this I is don't probably, care. I don't either. 
I don't either. I don't care. I've enjoyed it. I, um, I'm betting that this thing goes three episodes at this point. Okay. I think we're at an hour and a half. Um, Nobody's going to listen to me for three episodes. <laughs> Maybe they'll listen for you, but I don't for know. Me. I don't know. I don't. Okay. I'm not sure why people listen to this yet. I just know the Lord put it on my heart, and um, and I'm doing it. And I think people, it's, some are listening. I think it's great. Okay, so what what do we want to say in in terms of encouragement? What We're, what message would you have the remnant, the ones that are showing up? Do not be discouraged by what's going on in the world. It's not a surprise. Jesus warned us about every bit of it. He told us all of it. You are right where you're supposed to be. If you are a child of God, and especially if He's planted you in a in a in a church right here in your neighborhood in your community, enjoy every second of it. And how do we flourish in that environment? You seek personal revival. I mean, that's 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 the only thing you can do. It's between you and God. You can't fix the neighbor next to you. You can't fix the other people in your church. You can't make them get closer to the Lord, but you can, mm-hmm. okay? And by the same token, if you want to see your pastor really revived and, and excited about his ministry, you let a few people in his church get excited about the Word of God mm-hmm. yep. and, and, and get excited about service and coming and showing up. Spurgeon said, you don't defend the Bible, you turn it loose. Oh, that's good. That's very good. Yeah. I wish I'd have thought of that one myself. Yeah, well, you're not old enough. (laughs) Can I plagiarize? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. He's dead. He won't care. It was before copyright laws anyway. Um, Tell people where they can catch up with John Gator if they... You know, something that they want to argue with you or or congratulate or be proud of you for. First of all, I'm not proud of you for saying Gator. There's an S on the end of that, and you've seen it a thousand times. I know that. Yes, I know. Why am I doing that? I don't know. Shame on me. (laughs) I'm so sorry, John. I'm not offended by it. I'm making fun of you. You You should. You've said my name correctly for six Uh, years. Yeah, I know. And all of a sudden, I (laughs) punt. Goodness. I panicked. I was on the microphone. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> well, I've bragged on you a lot today. I know. So well, I've got to. You know, I need to take me down. I've got to bring a sour note to it. <laughs> catch up with. What do you mean, catch up with me? Like somebody's going to listen to the podcast and want to reach out to you directly. How are they going to do that? Oh, you got uh, books. You we got have, a website. You got. We have a church website, mm-hmm. fbcbemistn dot org. B e m i s t n is in Tennessee. Where Bemis is actually not. A city anymore. It was absorbed by Jackson, yep. I guess, in the 80s. So we're Jackson, Tennessee, but we still have the name First Baptist Bemis. Um, that's where I'm at. Yes, I have a book. You know, I have a book, uh-huh. but I was trying not to plug it. I am. Oh, okay. So I have a book called Five Forgotten Truths, and the byline is that church must remember. Mm-hmm. I'm actually getting ready to start on my second one. I want to, I've got another one that I want to do Five Forgotten Teachings. Some things that Jesus taught us that we don't remember, but it's called Five Forgotten Truths. It's available on Amazon.com, and I think it's still on ChristianBook.com. Um, and it's sort of my my understanding of theology through my my travel through church, mm-hmm. my church experience, especially ministry experience, and how I came to understand theology through that. So I've had some people say that it's they've had to read it more than one time. I don't think it's very scholarly, but it's not very it's not real elementary either. Mm. Um and it's not a real hard it's not a hard read. It's not real long. The I'm, second one will probably be a little more scholarly because there's some there's some stuff I've got to cover. Mm. I just feel it's on my heart that I have to. When when's that due out? Oh, I don't know. I haven't written it yet. Okay, I'm, I'm, right. I'm for. It's going. It's in my brain and it's in my notes. Gotcha. What will happen is if it's like the first book because I, I wrote the first book like nine years ago. Um, I spent probably a year preparing, and then I sat down and within like two weeks, boom, the whole thing was written. And then I just had to go back and you know get the editing and stuff. 
How do I not have an autographed copy of that? Um, I have a copy here, and it you will go home with one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. I need another. That's need... sort of one of my uh, trophy things. So from all the churches that we've been, yes. If, if you've written a book, I I need a copy of it. You shall have one today, okay. my all right. brother. Okay. All right. Um, I want you, thank you for your time. So so you've talked about the book. They can get it on Amazon, you said. Correct. And you've talked about the church's website, um, email address. Just email the church. For me? Yep. John R. Gators at AOL.com. And that's G-A-T-E-R-S. Keep the S on there, Chris. At AOL.com. At AOL. Oh, you were an original. I'm old. Did you keep it? Yeah, why not? Oh, my gosh. It's a relic. Yeah, it is. Like, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's vintage email yeah. right there. Yeah, it is. Yes. Oh, my goodness. I didn't even realize they were still in business, but yeah. I guess somebody bought the uh, They're still the there. Name, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so then the last thing I want you to do is pray, and we will be dismissed. I would love to. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had to just sit down and talk about you today and talk about your marvelous church, Lord. I thank you so much for Chris and his family, and I thank you, Father, for his friendship. And I want to thank you also for those who may be listening to this today, and I do pray that they would find some encouragement in all of this. I pray that they would be reminded, uh, Father, that you you know the beginning and the end, and you've explained it to us, and you've shared it all with us. There are no surprises, really in this world. And so, Father, I just pray that you help us to grasp hold of that. And Father, for those of us who are part of this remnant, dear God, that we would just uh, truly be revived. And Lord God, we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. John, thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. This was great. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Ministry on the Move. I've been your host, Chris McNeil. Join me next time. Uh, we'll be in Michigan. Um, Josh Corbin is the pastor that I'm going to interview of North Flushing Baptist Church. Um, it was the first time to meet him and had a great time. Wonderful interview. It's about an uh, hour and 15 minutes long. We'll have it carved up into two episodes. Please like and subscribe, share, email us. You can reach us at mcneilmusic.tv, chris at mcneilmusic.com. We sure would love to hear from you and yours. Tell us what you like about the show and what we can do better in the future. God bless you. So in honor of Father's Day, which was this last Sunday, what do you call a fake dad? A faux pas.